Hello everyone, my name is Ian. You're watching Big Rock Moto. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Now, before you click away, I know that there's so many reviews out there already about this, the Yamaha Tenere 700. But here's what I wanna do today. I've owned this bike and been riding it on a lot of different trips for the past six months. And while I found some things that I really do truly love about this motorcycle, I've also found some pretty significant things that I really don't like and I wanna share with you and go in detail on some of those things because I think what's happened with this motorcycle because it's so well priced and there's so little competition for it at that price, it's been maybe a little bit overhyped by some people. So here's what we're gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna start with the positive stuff and talk about the four things that I really do love about the Tenere 700. And then I'm gonna go in depth and talk about four things that I really truly don't like about the Yamaha Tenere 700. So with that out of the way, let's just jump right in and get started and start talking about the things that I really love about this bike. So the number one thing I love about the Yamaha Tenere 700 has to do with the motor. So it's Yamaha's CP2 parallel twin engine. And a lot of people have talked about this engine. They use it in other motorcycles beyond just the T7. Here's why I like it so much. Uh, number one is that it has a lot of character. It's fun to ride. So it sounds amazing. Um, it has a good feel to it. It makes linear power at all RPM. So all the way from idle, all the way to redline, it feels like it makes the same amount of torque. So it is fun to ride for more advanced riders, but it's also easy to ride for newer or more beginner riders who may just be getting into uh, adventure bikes or motorcycles in general. Not only is this motor really good for off-road riding because it doesn't stall, it doesn't stall nearly as much as some other motorcycles in this uh, adventure category. So at low RPM, at low speeds, uh, first gear is geared really well. Uh, and it, it doesn't want to stall out uh, all those situations where you see people stall out and kind of fall over, right? Like on steep hills, it doesn't like to do that. For off-road riding, the engine is very tractable. It's very smooth. It doesn't have any surprises in the power. It's just very good for uh, an off-road motorcycle engine. But also on the street, it's engaging to ride. It's fun to ride. You can rev it all the way out to redline. Uh, I mentioned it sounds great, it feels great. There's really zero to complain about in terms of the engine. And of course, the other thing great about it is that it's proven to be one of the most reliable motorcycle engines uh, currently in production. So the number two thing that I love about the Tenere 700 is the value you get. So what do I mean? Well, if you look at what kind of adventure motorcycle you can buy brand new for around the $10,000 US mark, there's just nothing that competes with this if you look at the performance and the capability that you're getting for the money. Uh, you could look at something like the uh, Suzuki V-Strom 650 or even a Kawasaki Versus 650. Uh, there's other bikes you can look at. I've done a lot of reviews uh, this past year. But because this bike has such a high degree of off-road capability and also such a high degree of uh, also on-road and touring capability, um, mix that in with all the great features that it has, a great engine, uh, the reliability, uh, the styling, there's just, for that price, this is it. This is what you're gonna buy. And because of that, Yamaha has a major supply shortage. They cannot build and deliver enough motorcycles to meet the demand, at least here in the USA. I don't know how it is in other countries. Now it is true that for the 2022 model year, Yamaha increased the MSRP by I think two or $300, uh, which frankly, I think we should be happy that they didn't do it more because uh, if you look at the prices in the used market for this motorcycle, I think Yamaha could probably get 11,000 or more uh, in terms of a sticker price for this bike brand new, but they chose to keep it relatively stable. Okay, so the third thing that I love about the Tenere 700 is the reliability. Now, this is not just speaking from my own experience with the bike, having zero issues whatsoever uh, of this bike over its, it has about 8,000 miles on it right now, but also speaking for other riders around the world. So uh, because I do this kind of thing for a living now at reviewing motorcycles, I do a lot of research. I read the forums. I 
um, a member of the social media groups, I talk to other riders, I go to events and rallies and motorcycle shows, it's really hard to uncover any significant issues that this platform has had. Now, that's not to say there's things I don't like about it and we're about to get to that, but if you look at actual reliability, the engine, the transmission, the chassis, the electronics, which albeit are pretty basic, um, the, uh, all the fixtures and fittings of the bike, there's really no uh, reliability issues to speak of. Um, and the fact is, if you buy one of these bikes, you'll probably never ever have to go back to the dealer for any sort of warranty claim. Uh, that's not to say that there couldn't be a tiny issue that crops up, and there are a few little design flaws that we'll talk about, but the reliability is amazing, and that's important for an adventure bike because people want to use adventure bikes in remote, distant corners of the earth on long rides far away from any cities or service centers. And so if you have a bike that breaks down a lot, that's just a very bad situation for an adventure bike that serious riders are going to use for long distance travel. This doesn't have that. So we're already seeing this be adopted by a lot of those hardcore round the world type riders just because it doesn't break down. Now, the fourth thing that I love about the T7 is the styling. Now, you can be the judge of that. I'm speaking for myself, how I think it looks. I think it looks amazing. I love the styling of the bike, and I'm actually really fond of this white and red color scheme, which I think was only in the first year of production. Uh, I think it looks like a rally bike. It looks cool, it looks purposeful, it looks aggressive, but it's not overdone. It doesn't look like an alien like the KTM bikes do. Uh, I get a lot of compliments, a lot of questions about the bike, and I've never heard anyone say that they didn't like the way it looks. So I think Yamaha really nailed that aspect of it, and I hope that they really maintain this kind of styling theme going forward. And truly, it'd be awesome to see them release the Super Tenere 1200 with this styling. Okay, so let's get into the four things that I don't like about the Yamaha T7. Now, before I go into that, please keep in mind that I'm not trying to be negative. I'm not trying to make this a bash of this bike. As you guys know, I do love this motorcycle, and I think that all the praise that it's earned from journalists and owners worldwide is well-deserved, and I agree with it. However, there's some things that I really want to point out because if you're looking at getting this bike, especially with more competition coming into the marketplace over the next couple of years, bikes like the Touareg 660, uh, Ducati's new bike, all the other choices out there, of course the KTM 890 and the Norden 901 as well, there's some things that you need to keep in mind if you're seriously looking at investing in this platform. Uh, for the first thing, I'm going to jump on the bike and talk about something that really bugs me about the T7. So the Yamaha Tenere 700 is top heavy. Here's what I mean. Look at, number one, look at how tall the engine is. Now I've actually measured this compared to other twin cylinder motorcycles. The engine is very tall if you measure from the bottom of the oil sump to the top of the valve cover. What that causes is Yamaha has to put the gas up very, very high. So if you look at the gas tank, it's actually level with the handlebars on this motorcycle. And it's about level with my belly button here. Now, if you compare that to something like a KTM 790 or 890 or even the Norden 901, the gas on that bike is like down here. The gas tank sits way down here and it carries its fuel and a saddle down low. Now, getting back to my point, um, the motorcycle feels very tippy and very top heavy. So once you get it leaned over to about right here, it already wants to fall over. It's very hard for me right now to keep it from tipping over. Um, even though the gas tank is not very big, it just carries its weight very high. The engine sits high and it pushes everything up. Um, the other thing that causes is, well, here, let me just show you. This is a reality of riding an adventure bike. You might drop your bike on the street, even if you don't ride off-road, but if you do ride on a trail, you're going to fall, you're going to crash your motorcycle eventually. If you're riding by yourself, you need to lift the motorcycle. Now the first thing to notice is, look how flat the motorcycle falls. Now that's not too uncommon, a lot of motorcycles will do that, with the exception of maybe something like a 1200 GS, which has the cylinders to prevent it from falling over that far, which I really like about the GS. Um, this motorcycle is very difficult to lift. Uh, 
it feels more like a 600 pound motorcycle than it does a 450 pound motorcycle. Um, let me kind of show you lifting it. It's actually very difficult even for an experienced and relatively uh, strong rider like me to lift this bike. So people always want to criticize lifting methods fine, be that as it may. There's different ways you can lift motorcycles. Everybody has their techniques, but no matter how you do it, this bike is very hard uh, to get up from this position. And it's only gonna be made worse if you have luggage and camping gear affixed to the bike. So I don't care how good of a rider you are or how much you've practiced this, this motorcycle, even though it's relatively lightweight, is a total pain to lift off the ground. The other problem that the high center of gravity causes or uh, issue that it causes is the handling of the bike is not as sharp and not as responsive as something like the KTM 890. So it doesn't transition as fast and it feels just a bit more sluggish and not as well balanced because it carries its weight, the engine and the fuel up pretty high. Okay, so now that I've thoroughly embarrassed myself in front of the world, the second thing that I don't like about the Tenere 700 is the fuel range and the fuel capacity. So here's what I mean. The bike carries 4.2 gallons of fuel or about 16 liters. Now, most people get, including myself, around 50 miles per gallon US. That gives you a range of around 130 to 140 miles before the fuel light starts blinking on the dash. Now that makes you nervous because you think you're about to run out of fuel. Now in reality, I found that the gas gauge is pretty pessimistic. So you probably have about a gallon and a half left at that point. Um, your actual range, I mean, if you're getting 50 miles a gallon and you have four gallons, that's 200 miles, right? But you can't use every ounce in the fuel tank, nor would you want to really run it that close. So realistically, you might consider around 150 to 170 miles to be your fuel range. Now, for where I live and how I like to ride in the Western USA, and I know people in places like Australia and other more open areas of the world where there's long distances between fuel stops, this is not enough range for a lot of us uh, with our adventure bike. What it means is that a lot of us are having to carry extra fuel. Uh, carrying that extra fuel either on the rear rack or in your panniers or however you want to mount it. There are some aftermarket fuel tanks as well. You're adding weight back onto the bike and you're adding weight up high to compound the already top heavy feeling of this bike. So that's something that I really would like to see different. Now, I'm also concerned that if Yamaha did expand the fuel tank, because the fuel tank sits up pretty high and contributes to the top heaviness, I, I don't know if putting on a larger fuel tank would be a good idea. It would extend the range, but I worry that it would make the motorcycle feel even heavier than it already does. The third thing that I don't love about the Yamaha Tenere 700 is the suspension. Now look, I get it. It is a relatively budget adventure motorcycle, so I don't expect amazing suspension for what this bike costs. However, some of the things I'm about to talk about would not have cost Yamaha any additional dollars to simply get right from the factory. So here's what I mean about the suspension. Um, there's two big things when we're talking about suspension. The first is the spring rates and the second is the damping. Now I'm going to have a detailed video about the suspension on this bike and what you can do to address it in an affordable manner uh, in the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that. Let's talk about the spring rates. The bike comes with spring rates that are suitable for a 150 pound rider carrying basically no luggage. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but I do not weigh 150 pounds and I also do not ride the bike completely naked without any luggage or without passengers or things like that. What this means in practice is that the average size rider around 200 pounds gearing up, which adds even more weight, putting luggage on, which adds weight, and not even to mention carrying a passenger, that average situation 
pushes the bike down so far in the suspension stroke just when you sit on the bike that the suspension performance and the handling of the bike is pretty significantly compromised. Uh, the motorcycle uses a linkage rear suspension and it's a progressive rate linkage. What that means is that the further you go down into that suspension stroke, the harder the suspension gets. So if you think about that, um, you're supposed to have the sag, the rider sag, or the amount that the bike sits down in the stroke when you sit in it with your luggage to be around 25% to 30% of the total travel. But in practice, most riders are sagging the bike around 50%, which is way, way too much. You don't have much suspension travel left once you sit on the bike and start riding it. And also, the suspension action is much more harsh than it's supposed to be uh, because you've used up so much of the travel and you're in that harder part of the suspension stroke. Also, the soft fork springs in the front forks contribute to a lot of brake dive. So when you're hard on the brakes, the motorcycle wants to dive forward and that upsets the chassis dynamics and sort of the handling uh, when you're riding more aggressively on the street. This is a very frustrating problem because they could have easily put in stiffer springs uh, that would accommodate the average rider and the average riding situation. That wouldn't have cost them any more money to spring it properly. Now let's talk about the suspension damping. Now it does have full adjustments for the damping, compression damping and rebound damping at both front and back, and that's a great thing that they included that. However, the damping quality is just average. It's not excellent. Um, it doesn't do a great job absorbing the small chatter on the trail, nor does it do a great job of the bigger hits. However, I will say that once you spring the bike correctly, and you should absolutely, before you do anything else to the suspension, make sure you have the right springs in for your weight and your riding style. Even when you do that, um, the damping action is, it's okay, it's not bad, and, and I'm pretty happy with it uh, just by re-springing it. But the damping could be better, but I kind of get that for the price. What I don't get is how the bike is so severely undersprung, especially in the rear shock. Just to give you a reference for that, the rear shock spring is a uh, 70 uh, kilogram per millimeter spring, and the average rider is gonna need to go up to something like an 85 kilogram per newton meter uh, rear spring. So it's, it's just severely undersprung for the way the average person is going to use it and that affects how the bike handles on and off-road. So the fourth and final thing that I don't love about the T7 is the way Yamaha has decided to hang the exhaust from the rear of the bike. Uh, so essentially the problem is this. You see this bracket right here. This is actually a welded on piece of the frame of the motorcycle. So guess what happens? You crash or drop the bike here. You can already see it has quite a bit of slop in it. You push this in and it bends, essentially bends the frame because this is part of the frame. Now, I don't know why Yamaha chose to use a welded on bracket instead of a bolt on replaceable piece. But because they've chosen to do that, it makes it susceptible to being bent. And if you bend this enough times, uh, bending it in and out and repairing it, uh, you'll get metal fatigue and eventually you can actually break this bracket off. The other thing I don't understand is why Yamaha did not simply take the pipe from this point and route it up uh, closer into the bike, um, more near uh, the frame of the bike. I don't understand why they did not do that. There's probably some reason. I do think it looks cool like this. Maybe it looks more like a rally bike with this exhaust um, in this position, but it's very bad from an actual practical point of view. Now, if you're a rider who is not going to go on the trail or you're not planning to really drop your bike very often, then this may not be a problem. But if you're going to use it as a hardcore adventure bike, um, this is going to eventually present itself as an issue for you. Uh, now, there are aftermarket solutions, of course, but that costs money and time. And I just don't really understand why Yamaha um, engineered the bike this way. Uh, what also can happen is that when you do that um, and this whole thing gets pushed in, the exhaust as you're riding will rub on the swing arm. You can't see this here, but there's actually very little clearance uh, between the swing arm and the exhaust. So if this gets pushed in more than about an inch or so, um, you're going to be riding and it's going to be actually contacting the subframe as the suspension goes up and down. Final thoughts on the Yamaha Tenere 700. This bike has already achieved a legendary cult-like, almost mythical status uh, around the world. And I do think it's deserving of that. It's very, very rare that a motorcycle like this comes around. If you look at the unique combination of the styling, the capability, the reliability, uh, the value, the price, um, 
This is rare, and frankly, there's really no competition for this. It's a mystery why companies like Kawasaki and Honda and Suzuki are not producing a competitor to this bike. I'm sorry, but the V-Strom or the Versus or the CB500, those types of bikes, I've reviewed those bikes, they're wonderful, but they don't compete with this. This is a legitimate bike that you can ride hardcore off-road riding with and still have a great street riding experience. It's good for beginners and it's good for more advanced riders. Now, I'm getting ready to say goodbye to this bike, sadly, and here's the reason for that. To be honest, Reviewing motorcycles is uh, my business now, so I have to buy and sell things to make fresh content. That's just the reality of my job. So I can't afford to just keep a bike forever and not have new stuff to make content with. Now, if it wasn't for the fact that I was had to buy new bikes to make fresh content, I would keep this bike. It's an amazing motorcycle, despite the things that I've talked about, the top heaviness, the little issue with the exhaust, a few things like that, I can overlook that because the truth is, all the positives I've talked about are so true and it's just a unique motorcycle that is really uh, going to stand the test of time in terms of its styling, its capability, its reliability, and it has universal appeal. Um, I would never ever uh, not recommend this bike. So if anyone asks me, oh, should I get the T7? I would say yes. Um, unless you're really short and you have trouble with the height of the bike, there's, there's really nothing to significantly complain about here beyond the few things I've talked about, which you could say are nitpicking, but it's my job to bring you uh, what I feel is the truth of an actual ownership experience beyond just marketing hype. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I hope you all have gotten value out of this video. If you have, you know all the ways you can support the channel. They're all in the description below. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I truly appreciate you being a part of this community. Uh, ride safe and we'll see you out there.